We're continuing today to talk about just a, an overview of the Bible, and um, today I want to talk about the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. That's what the Bible is all about. When, you, when it all boils right down to, everything points to this moment in time when Jesus came to the earth to save us. And um, I don't know, I mean, more, the more that I read the Bible in these days, I just see, I don't know, it just, this stands out as the most important event in the entire history of, of mankind, is the coming of Jesus Christ to save us. It all began back in Genesis 3, and I want to pray, and we'll start there. So, Father, I ask this morning that you would open our hearts to your word today, teach us by your Holy Spirit. I pray that somehow we could understand more completely the work that you came to do as the Messiah of this world, the, the Christ, the one who came to set things right again. I pray, Lord, you open our eyes to see that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first promise about a Messiah coming and when we say Messiah, let me just give the term. We're talking about the anointed one. The word Messiah just means the anointed one. Somebody who's been anointed by God for a purpose. And there was this idea in the Bible that God would one day send a Messiah, somebody who was like the ultimate anointed one, who would make everything right again, who would turn around the work the devil had done and make things right again. And it all began with this prophecy in Genesis 3, it's after God created the world, and then, you know, mankind was deceived by Satan, the serpent. They ate the fruit, and they became lost in sin. And that, in a way, destroyed what God had intended. It was the work of the enemy that destroyed what God intended for us from the beginning of time. That we would be with him, that we would have a relationship with him. It would be righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit all the time. And Satan came and deceived us, and we bought into the lie. And sin came upon every human being. And it's because of sin that the world is the condition it's in today. It's why our lives are like they are today. It's why we die. It's why we're sick. It's why there's hatred and violence. And you know all the things that we see and read about and hear on the news, it's there because of what Satan did on that day in the Garden of Eden. He deceived this woman. And one little bite of a piece of fruit changed the trajectory of the direction of mankind. But the Lord, you know, he's not about to settle for, being, uh, this, for this continuing. He wanted to put an end to it. So at the very beginning, when man first fell, this, this prophecy came out. It says this in verse 13. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. So there is this enmity now between Satan and us, the woman, people, and also between your offspring and her offspring. So, you know, Satan is the enemy of all mankind. I want you to know that. He has nothing good for you. No good intentions. It's to kill, steal, and destroy is all he is interested in, to devour. And the Lord doesn't want that. And so he wants to put enmity between Satan and his people, which he has, and we, he is our enemy. But the fact of the matter is, when we're deceived, we oftentimes don't see him as an enemy. And we're courted by him. And he draws us to himself, and he continues to deceive in the world. He still walks around this world seeking whom he may devour. And his, his same deception, his same lies are out there continually drawing people after himself. And the rejection of Jesus is really the following of the serpent if you think about it that way. The rejection of Jesus is not neutral ground. 
The rejection of Jesus is the following after the lies of the serpent. So he said here, I will put enmity between your offspring and her offspring. And then he says these words, he will bruise your head, her offspring, which this is speaking about Jesus. This is, he's, he's pointing to a time coming when there's going to be this offspring of the woman and she's going to, her offspring is going to step on the serpent's head. Now, how many of you know if you step on the head of the snake, it's pretty much a lethal blow. But also he said that you shall bruise his heel so that in the crushing of the serpent, there's also the biting of the heel. And that's the death that Jesus died. But you know, the biting of the heel was not a lethal blow because Jesus rose from the dead, amen? amen. But Satan would one day have this lethal blow by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is really setting up what the work of the Messiah would all be about. There's a day coming when this one chosen from God will destroy the thing that's destroyed you. And he will deal a lethal blow with him, even though he himself will be bruised in his heel. Now, you remember last week we talked about the prophets, how they were constantly working with the kings of Israel. They were telling them to repent and to turn to God and reminding them of all the good things that the Lord had done. But also, in the midst of all their prophecies and calling to repentance, they were also constantly pointing forward to there's a day coming. There's a day coming when the Lord will bring about righteousness. There's a day coming when the Lord will heal the people. He will heal the land. There's a day coming. And he kept pointing to this Messiah, this anointed one who would come and make everything right again. And so at the end of Malachi, there was a, a thing spoken here. And I want to put up on the board there. He says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now this was one of the last things ever spoken by any prophet in the Old Testament. It's the last book. And he says, there's a day coming when Elijah will come. And he's going to be saying something about this awesome day of the Lord. And then you found there were 400 years of silence. That God didn't speak for 400 years. Who can think back 400 years ago? I mean, we're talking about, what, 1622. What was happening in the world in 1622? Was Ron here, you said? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 400 years is a long time for God not to speak. But what was happening, though, is he was... Remember the history we've gone through and we saw the constant failure of Israel, the constant failure of the kings, the constant rejection, the constant rebellion of the people. And yet, all this time, God is saying, I'm faithful to my covenant. I'm faithful to do what I promised. I'm faithful to do this work. And it all began right here with this thing in Genesis we read, that the day would come when he would step on the head of the serpent. And so he's pointing to this in the book of Malachi, saying there's a day coming. And then 400 years of silence. And then in Matthew 11, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets of the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. And so, you know, Jesus points to this idea that what Malachi spoke about, that Elijah would come, that's John the Baptist. And so he became a forerunner to Jesus Christ. He became a forerunner to the Messiah, announcing he's coming now. And he talks about this idea of the kingdom of heaven coming. Because who knows, if you have a kingdom, what else do you have? A king. And so the Messiah was often viewed by the, the people of God as some sort of king, kind of like David, who would come and conquer. And so the message that John the Baptist spoke and even the message Jesus spoke was the kingdom of heaven is here. There's a new day coming. And the, and the word in front of that was repent. In other words, change your mind. Turn, turn back because there's something different going to happen here. We've had the kingdom of Satan that has ruled and reigned for all this time. He, he's destroyed the people of this world. 
But now there's a new kingdom, a new king, and he's announcing that through John the Baptist, this Elijah who would come. And then John the Baptist had this testimony in John chapter 1. He said, I myself did not know him, even though Jesus was his cousin. He never knew him. But he who sent me to baptize, that was the Lord, said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so we have a, a testimony here of, of John the Baptist that when he was baptizing people and calling the nation to repent, turn because there's this new kingdom coming. Change your way. Turn because there's a king coming, the one that we've been waiting for. There's uh, this announcement's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Repent. Get ready. And then the Lord said to him, hey, one day when you're baptizing, you're going to see somebody walk down here and they're going to get baptized and you're going to see the spirit of God come upon him and remain there. And when you do, he's the one. And so John said, I didn't know, I didn't know him. But remember what happened when John baptized Jesus? The Bible says there was a voice from heaven and the heavens opened up and the spirit of God came upon him like a dove. And the Lord said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and he remained on him. And that's what the anointing is. That's what made him the Christ. So announced by John the Baptist, 400 years of silence, but yet, for whatever reason, the Lord has his timing. He brought Christ at the right time, and he anointed him to become the Christ, the, the Messiah, the anointed one. Now, I want to read a few scriptures that talk about what kind of work he would do. Acts 10, verse 37. When Messiah comes, what's he going to do? Acts 10, verse 37 says, well, this is when... Uh, Peter was speaking to a man by the name of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. Didn't know, didn't know Jesus. He had a heart that was turning toward God. But then Peter went to speak to him about who Jesus really was. And he says, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus. That's Messiah. He became the Christ, the anointed one. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good, that's one thing, and healing all oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. So what's the work of Messiah here? He came about doing good. The Holy Spirit was upon him with power. And Jesus' life was all about doing good. He did good everywhere he went. But it wasn't just doing good. It was also healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. Because remember, there's an enemy. There's the enemy, the serpent, the enemy of our soul, the one who deceived us, the one who drew us into sin because of our own willingness to be deceived. Jesus came to defeat him. And so when he came upon the earth and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and with power, he had a mission, and that was one day I'm going to step on his head. I want to make it possible for those who have been deceived by him, to be set free again, to come and be the kind of people he intended us to be from the very beginning. And so Jesus came to do good and to heal all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. Isaiah 35 speaks about the work Messiah would do. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. This is, this is a prophecy about the Messiah, spoken 700 years before Jesus would come. He said, your God will come with vengeance. And Jesus did come with vengeance. And he's coming again with vengeance on the judgment day. But he came the first time with vengeance against the enemy. He came to destroy him who had the power of death. So he came with vengeance and also with the recompense or the reward. So Jesus came as Messiah, with vengeance, but also with a reward. He, he brought both, a recompense of God. He will come and save you. Remember, th these were prophesied to the people. If you remember, we're talking about the, these kings of Israel and kings of Judah who were, for the most part, rebellious toward the Lord. And the people were living these terrible lives of, you know, 
sin and, and all kinds of, 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 of atrocities and burning their children upon these altars to the god Molech, and all kinds of terrible things were happening. In the midst of that, God is saying, hey, the Lord's coming. The Lord's coming with vengeance, but he's also coming with the reward, and he's coming to save you. He wants to deliver you from this. And these are the promises of the Messiah. And so he gives some examples. He says, the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. This is the work Messiah would do. And if you read the story of Jesus in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are the very things you see him doing, don't you? He's opening the eyes of the blind. He's opening the ears of the deaf. It says, the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. This is the work of Messiah. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. It's like he's making everything right again. Like you have a desert, I'm going to bring streams. You have a deaf person, I want them to hear again. You have a blind person, I want them to see again. This is the work of Messiah, to make things right, to heal those oppressed by the devil, to turn things around, to be the way God intended it to be. And he came with a vengeance to do that work. Now, John the Baptist, remember, he's the one who saw Jesus. He's the one who saw the dove come down from heaven. One day, he was thrown into jail because he basically reproved the king at the time for his, uh, his life of adultery, and he ended up in prison. And when he's in there, he had his disciples go ask a question of Jesus. Look at verse uh, 2 of Matthew 11. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, the, the word the Christ is the Messiah. That's Christ would be the Greek, Messiah would be the Hebrew. So he's hearing about the deeds of Messiah. He sent word by his disciples, and he said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Doesn't that seem like a strange question to the guy who actually had the testimony that the one that you see the the Holy Spirit come upon and remain. He's the one. And now he's questioning, are you the one? I don't know why he asked this question. I mean, there's some speculation that maybe John had this idea that the Messiah was going to come in like a King David and wipe out all the enemies. And maybe he was sitting in prison expecting that one day Jesus was going to come in and break the prison doors and John was going to be set free. I don't know. Maybe that's why. He's sitting there wondering, hey, Jesus, I thought, you were, I thought you were the Messiah. Aren't you coming to set us free? Aren't you the king? Aren't you going to destroy our enemies? We have these Romans who are occupying our land. We're like slaves of them. Aren't you coming to set us free if you're the Messiah? Because that was one of, the, one of the main thoughts that these people had, that Messiah was going to come like a King David type figure. And so here he is kind of languishing in prison, wondering, hey, are you, are you really the guy? Have you ever had a time in your life when you were walking with Jesus and you knew he was the one, but then maybe you got thrown into prison or something like that and you kind of wondered, hey, are you really the one? And John had that kind of a moment here. Are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? And Jesus answered, basically, he quoted Isaiah 35. He said, go back and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have good news preached to them. This is the work of Messiah. There, you don't need any more proof than to see what's happening here. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm doing. I'm preaching the good news. And I'm doing this work to destroy the work of the enemy. This is the work of Messiah. And then he, he kind of says, blessed is the one who was not offended by me. I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe John was offended that Jesus wasn't setting him free. Sometimes we feel like God is all about what's going on in my life. And he does care about you. I, don't get me wrong. I love the, I love the tone of the, the worship today about just you know, God loves our heart. He draws so close to us individually, uniquely in our hearts. It's so good and it's so true. 
But he's not about our comfort. It's not, it's not all about, I mean, you know, John the Baptist had his head chopped off. And he was still the cousin of Jesus. He was still the forerunner. He was still the one who would be the voice in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And maybe from John's perspective, Jesus didn't come through for him. But what was Jesus doing? He was doing what Messiah came to do. He had, a, he had a big vision, a big plan, which is to destroy the works of the enemy. And sometimes our individual hopes and desires maybe don't necessarily fit into his big plan. Have anybody found that out in your life? That maybe the little hopes and desires you have don't necessarily fit into his plan? And that may be the case. But Jesus said, blessed is the person who is not offended in me. We just have to realize that he is the Messiah. He's doing what the Messiah does. And maybe that means you're set free from the prison, and maybe it means you get your head chopped off. But he's doing his work. He's doing what he came to do. And I trust him. I trust him 110% for whatever that might look like in, in our lives. That's where we have to come to that place. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. So I want to talk just briefly here as I close. In the Old Testament, there were really like three types of people that had the anointing in their life. They were kings, priests, and prophets. And they were, in a sense, kind of a picture, a snapshot of what Messiah would be like. And so I want to talk, first of all, about Messiah as king. Messiah as king. In Matthew 22... While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Messiah or the Christ? What do you think about him? Whose son is he? And they said to him, son of David. See, they knew Messiah was going to come through the lineage of David. He would be a rightful king, king of Judah. So whose son is he? And they said, well, he's the son of David. And so Jesus said, how is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord. How can someone be your son and still be your Lord? That's the question Jesus is asking them. You say the Messiah is David's son, but David calls him Lord. And he quotes the scripture that David wrote, The Lord said to my Lord, The Lord, the Father, said to my Lord, the Messiah, Sit at my right hand. Until what? Until your enemies are under your feet. See, Messiah came to conquer. Sit at my right hand until all the enemies are under your feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed, the Bible says, is death. So we have this, this ongoing work of Messiah. Even yet, today, even though Jesus lived on the earth physically for three and a half years, the work of Messiah is still going on because he's seated at the right hand of the Father until all the enemies are under his feet. And now... He says, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And when you say he's my Lord, you're saying Yahweh, you're, you are God. And so I want you to know that the Messiah, the true Messiah, sent to deliver us from the work of the enemy, is the Lord himself. It's not just a powerful man, not just a powerful teacher, not just a powerful prophet. Not just a powerful king. And there were powerful kings. And there were powerful prophets. But this Messiah is the Lord himself. David called him Lord. Not just his son. And the Bible says no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone ask him any more questions. I like that. Psalm 2. I will tell the decree the Lord said to me. You are my son. So this is, a, this is like the Lord Jesus speaking to the Father. and said, the Lord said to me, you are my son. I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. When we talk about what is the work of Messiah, what is the Messiah actually doing? He's going out to bring the nations to himself. Ask of me. And I will give you the nations. You know what Jesus wants? He wants the nations. Remember the promise 
that he gave to Abraham through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Why is that? Because all the nations have been affected by Satan. All the nations have been deceived by the enemy. All the nations have been bitten by the serpent, so to speak. And so he's saying to to this Messiah, hey, ask of me and I will give you the nations. Aren't you glad that Jesus asked? Because you're there. This is an answer. You're an answer to this prayer. Jesus said to the father, father, give me the nations. He said, yes, and here, here it is. And we still live in a world today where nearly 2 billion people in this world have never, ever heard the name of Jesus. But guess what? The Bible says somebody from every one of those tribes and tongues and languages and nations, somebody from every one of those will come to the Messiah. Why? Because he's a conquering king. He's not going to finish. He is seated on the throne until all his enemies are under his feet. When you read that scripture, remember, you were an enemy. The Bible says we were all enemies of God in our minds by wicked works, by our sin. We were enemies of God. But you know what? When you read... When you read when you, <laughs> somebody get the translation of that. Uh, When you receive Jesus, you became under his feet. You're under the feet of Jesus. He's my Lord. He's conquered me. I hope he's conquered you. I hope the King of Kings has conquered you, that you're under his feet, because he will reign until all the enemies are under his feet. I will give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like the potter's vessel. I want you to know that, that is the end, that's the end, the end of this thing. It's the nations coming to Christ. And then in Isaiah 9, it talks about, of the, I'll, read, I'll read verse 7 just to kind of get through this. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. We're talking about a king who has a kingdom that will never end. All the kingdoms of this world come to an end at some point, but this kingdom, the kingdom of Messiah, will never end. It's an everlasting kingdom. And he says here, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. And look what it says there. The zeal of the Lord will do this. This isn't the work of man. This isn't the plan of the church. This is the zeal of the Lord. This is the work of Messiah. He's saying, my zeal has stirred me up. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. So we have the Lord Jesus, in all of his zeal, still working the work of Messiah to destroy the works of the enemy. When you get saved and you get delivered and you get set free and God changes your life, you know what you've... What's happened? You've come under the ministry of the Messiah to set us free, to open the prison doors, open the blind eyes. That's the work of Messiah. He is also the priest. You know, back in those days, there was kind of a a thought from some people that the Messiah would be a suffering servant, kind of like Isaiah 53 talks about. And others thought he would be a conquering king, but they couldn't see how those two things could be the same. It's it's interesting to me that the same person was both the suffering servant and the conquering king. And so we see here that Jesus as our priest in Romans 5, 6, it says, while we were still weak at the right time, Messiah, Christ, died for the ungodly. The Messiah died. And again, that kind of blew the minds of the the mindset of most people was he's going to be this conquering king. How could he die? That's what that's even even happened with the disciples who walked with him. They had this expectation that Jesus was coming in like King David to tear everything apart and set up his kingdom. And then here he is hung on a cross like a common criminal. But it was actually God's plan. Christ died for the ungodly at the right time. Hebrews 9, he entered once for all 
into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. I, I got, you guys got to picture this. You know, back in the Old Testament, we read, we learned about how the priests would come and they would bring sacrifices, offering these animals and spilling their blood as an atonement for the sins of the people. But the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. It's, it was only like a, a covering, like for, for a time, but they could never remove it. It had to take the Messiah, the perfect Messiah, the perfect Son of God, the Lamb of God, John the Baptist calls him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when Jesus died on the cross, what he did is he took his own blood into the holy places, right into the throne of the Lord, and he gave his blood. I mean, I don't know what that does to you, but we have, we have a Messiah who gave his life, and he didn't bring the blood of an animal. He didn't bring the blood of thousands of animals. He brought his own. And that's the only thing that could deliver us. It's the only thing that could set us free. It's the only thing that takes away sin. So you want to know how committed Jesus is to the work of Messiah? He gave his life for it. He's a priest, not only standing for us, interceding for us in the eyes of the Lord, but he's bringing the sacrifice to the Lord, which is his own blood. And he made a way for us to have a relationship with him. Hebrews 9.24, Christ entered not into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. I want you to know that today Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for all those enemies to be brought under his feet. But you know what the Bible also says? He's interceding for us. You can come to the throne of God today and ask Jesus for help. That's the work of Messiah, the ongoing work of Messiah to continue to help us, to set us free, to give us strength. He's there. He cares about us. He, he wants the best for us. Like we talked about this one. He wants that for us. And so he's there, not just waiting for the enemies to be destroyed as the conquering king, but he's there as this high priest interceding and mediating between us and the Lord. He is the true Messiah. And he lives there eternally. He's not a priest who can live and die like the Levitical priest. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which never ends. He's an eternal king. He has an eternal kingdom. He has an eternal priesthood. And this is Messiah. When you have your times of trouble, do you go to Jesus? He's there interceding for you. I hope you will. And then finally, the anointed one as the prophet. Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me. This is Moses speaking. He'll raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. You'll find often if you read through the New Testament, people would point to this. Are you the, are you the one, are you the prophet? Are you the one like Moses? And there was an idea that Jesus might be that one, the one that, would, that God would raise up, the Messiah, to be the voice, to speak for the Lord. And he says here in, in verse 16, Just as you desired of the Lord, your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. So if you remember, they came out to this mountain, and God wanted to speak to the people. He wanted to speak to them, so everybody heard his voice. He wanted to have that relationship, but the people were so freaked out by this power of God and the voice of the Lord and the lightnings and the thunder, they said, man, we're scared to death of it. We don't want to hear the voice of the Lord. They said, Moses, you go up there and you, you talk to him and you come back and tell us what he said because we just really can't stand being in this presence of God. And so Moses did what they asked. He, he acquiesced to it. But the Lord said, there's a day coming in verse 17, he said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. But I will raise up for them a prophet like you, someone like you, Moses, among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth. So this is talking about Jesus. You remember when Jesus walked through the earth, he said, I don't say anything unless the Father tells me. I speak the words of my Father. He's, he's a fulfillment of this prophecy 
that Moses spoke about, a Messiah who would come, who would be a prophet, the anointed of the Lord, who would speak for the Lord in the lives of the people here. He said, I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. I'll tell you what. <clears throat> we need to listen to the words of Jesus. He is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, who came to speak to us the words of the Father. And he's calling toward obedience here. Whoever will not listen, I will require it of him. There's a day coming, Jesus said, I won't judge you, but the very words I have spoken to you will judge you on that day. I hope that you take the words of Jesus seriously. When we read the Bible, and we read, you know, I mean, just get yourself a, a red letter version of the Bible and just read the words of Jesus sometime and challenge yourself with it. What, what is it that Jesus is saying? What is it that he wants from my life? Because he wants to speak to us like this anointed prophet from God. Don't be like the children of Israel who said, we don't want to hear this voice. We're afraid of this voice. Let somebody else tell me. Let the preacher tell me on Sunday morning. No, you need to go and hear the Lord speak to you. Listen to his voice. Open the word of God up and let the Lord have his way to speak into your life. But then respond to it because he's speaking the words of God. This is Messiah. So I'd like you to stand with me as we close. I want to read one last scripture here. It's up on the board so you can see it. Jesus is about ready to go to the cross. I mean, the moment's coming when he's going to step on the head of the serpent. And I'm telling you, I can't, I can't imagine what a glorious day that was in heaven. That for all those thousands of years that the people rebelled and turned their hearts that now this serpent was going to have his head stepped on. I just can't imagine how awesome and glorious that day was. And so Jesus is speaking about this time. It's coming up now. Father, glorify your name. It's, it's, it's to the glory of God the Father that Jesus did this work of Messiah. Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there heard it, and they said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel spoke, has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Amen? It's coming. A few days from now, I'm going to be hanging on a cross, and I'm going to be stepping on the head of the serpent. The judgment of this world now has come. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I say amen for that. And when I am lifted up from the earth, what's he going to do? I'm going to draw people to myself. And that's what he's still doing today. Jesus was lifted up from the earth. He was hung between heaven and earth on that cross. But he said, the reason I'm doing this is to draw people to myself. That's still the work that's ongoing today. The work of Messiah is still drawing people to himself, still defeating the work of the enemy that's in your life. And he will sit on that throne until every enemy is under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. There's going to be a day coming when everybody that's in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of Man and will come alive again. I mean, can you imagine how crazy that's going to look? When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. And so the crowd answered, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. We talked about that, haven't we? The Messiah will be forever, a forever kingdom, a forever priesthood. We've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? So they couldn't, they couldn't reconcile this idea that the one who should live forever should die. It didn't make sense. But what a, be what a beautiful plan that God had. None of, none of us could ever have imagined that this is how he would redeem the world to himself. That Jesus was both the suffering servant 
as well as the conquering king. He's our Messiah. He came to deliver us from all the work of the enemy. Three questions for you today. Well, it's actually six questions. <laughs> Two questions in each of three points. Is Jesus your king? Is he your king? And that's a question. And the follow-up question is, has he conquered the areas of your life? You know, am I under the feet of Jesus? I hope he is. If he's not, today, you can say, Lord, I want you to be my Messiah. I want you, I want you to be the conqueror of my life, and I surrender to you. Is he your priest? This follow-up question is, have you been cleansed by his blood? You know, there's no way, no way for you to get to heaven apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. If I ask you today, if you died today and had to stand before the Lord to give a reason why he should let you into heaven, if you say anything other than because of the blood of Jesus, you won't make it. It required the blood of a sacrifice. It required a perfect sacrifice. And our Messiah, Jesus, came and brought his own blood into the very presence of God to make a way for all the nations to come. If, if we could get to heaven any other way, the death of Jesus would have been unnecessary. None of us are capable when we read through the Old Testament and we see the failure of those people and the rejection and the rebellion and all those things, we have to put ourselves with them. This is us. This is who we were. And it took, it took the blood of Jesus. I mean, can you see how committed he is to this work of Messiah? He gave his very life for it. And the last question I have, is he your prophet? How do you take the words of this prophet? They'll be required of us. He came to speak the words of God to us. And I tell you, I think sometimes I, I, I feel a burden for the church at large. I don't mean the church here. I mean the church at large. I just feel a burden that sometimes we just take the words of Jesus so lightly. I mean, the, our obedience to the Lord is just taken so lightly, almost I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a burden because, you know, he is, he's this prophet who came to speak to us the words of God. I just pray that you will soften your heart to the word of God, that we would always be a people who sees this, this aspect of Messiah at work in our life and in the life of our church, that we believe the word of God, we hold to the word of God, we respond to the word of God. And when the word of God comes and says something to you that you don't like, like moving the chairs around. <laughs> you can say, Lord, I want to respond to that. I want to respond to you. I want to, I want to do things your way. I want, to, I want to do it your way, Lord. You are that voice to me. So as we pray, consider those three things. Is, is Jesus your Messiah? Is he your king? Is he your priest? Is he your prophet? So Lord, I pray for all of us here, Lord. I thank you so much for this powerful ministry that all the scriptures pointed to from Genesis 3 all the way through to John the Baptist stood upon the scene and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everything pointed to this day, Lord, when you wanted to deliver people from the hand of the enemy. Lord, I know we're still involved in that work and I pray we would be faithful to the part you have us play. And in the meantime, Lord Jesus, help us surrender to your kingship Help us rejoice in your priesthood and help us be responsive to you as our prophet to speak the words of the Lord to us. I ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.